Joe Lepore is the David Woods Kemper Professor of American History and Affiliate Professor of Law at Harvard University. She's also a staff writer at The New Yorker and host of the podcast, The Last Archive. Her many books include These Truths, A History of the United States, an international bestseller, which is named one of Time Magazine's top 10 nonfiction books of the decade. And uh, she'll be in conversation with Dana Boyd, who is the founder and president of Data and Society, a partner researcher at Microsoft Research and a visiting professor at New York University. Her research is focused on making certain that society has a nuanced understanding of the relationship between technology and society, especially as issues of inequity and bias emerge. She is the author of It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Network Teens, and has authored or co-authored numerous books, articles, and essays. She's a trustee of the National Museum of the American Indian, a director of the Social Science Research Council, and a director of Crisis Text Line. She has been recognized by numerous organizations, including receiving the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Barlow Award and being selected as a 2011 Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum. Originally trained in the computer science and computer science before retaining retraining under anthropologists. Dana has a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley School of Information. Will you please snap and clap and give emoticons for Dana and Jill? Uh, thanks so much, Jill. It's it's great to be with you all. I, I dearly, dearly wish that I was in Brooklyn <laughs> this evening, going out for a really nice dinner after hanging out in this beautiful library and getting a chance to meet all of you. But uh, this will have to do, and I couldn't be more excited to be in conversation uh, with this amazing interlocutor. So I, I thought I we uh, we decided that I would just begin by uh, telling you a little bit about the Simulmatics Corporation, uh, Joel. It's Simulmatics as in simple, and because um, uh, no one's heard of it, <laughs> it's an extraordinarily obscure story that I fell into uh, when I opened up an archival box uh, at the MIT Library and found a story that I it answered a lot of questions that I didn't even know I had. And so I, I felt really obligated to, uh, to write a book and, and, and to do that work. So Semomatics Corporation was founded in 1959 by uh, its president, a guy named Ed Greenfield, who's a dazzlingly charismatic Madison Avenue ad guy, uh, a devoted liberal philanthropist, a, a, a very devout supporter of civil rights causes, uh, who had worked on Democratic Party campaigns throughout the 1950s, uh, was also a really smart guy who was very drawn to, you know, the kinds of guys that David Halverson wrote about as the best and the brightest in a very kind of dry and ironic way. Um, he was really interested in the, the research being done in the behavioral sciences and in the emerging field of computer science in the 1950s. And uh, he was kind of like the Danny Ocean of, of the project. He put together this incredible team of people to design uh, uh, an election simulator. Um, we, you know, we rely on election simulators all the time now. If you follow, you know, 538 or, you know, you go to the Washington Post website, you're going to see election simulators all the time. But this was a brand new thing. Uh, in the 1950s. And then when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If you were interested in uh, trying to undertake a, uh, the creation of a predictive model for human behavior in the 1950s, voting would be the thing that you'd most likely want to work on because we have a tremendous amount of data. We have uh, census data, we have public opinion measurement, and then we have elections. So democracy generates its own election data. And uh, so people who are working in the quantitative social sciences were really drawn to the study of voting behavior. Simulmatics thought that that model could be used to, to predict all kinds of behavior, including consumer behavior, um, but especially political opinions and attitudes. So uh, the company was founded in 1959, was hired by the DNC and later by the John F. Kennedy campaign to provide election advice uh, for how to defeat uh, Richard Nixon in 1960. And uh, we could talk more about that. And, uh, but I want to just kind of briefly sketch out that after that project, Simulmatics worked in really every realm that predictive analytics is now deployed in, in a quite commonplace and ubiquitous way. Uh, they provided uh, advertising advice for companies like Colgate Palmolive and Ralston Purina. Like they, had, they did a simulation of consumer choice. Uh, they provided media advice for television stations. They did a big project for the New York Times on data analysis on election night. 
Uh, they did then a number of projects for the federal government, um, but the company was suffering by the middle of the 1960s. There wasn't enough data for most of the projects they wanted to do and computers weren't really fast enough to make this economically feasible. So though, although they had the idea that they could use computer technology to predict human behavior and sell that uh, as, as a business product, it was a hard sell. Uh, so the company turned to uh, a new kind of work in 1965, set up an office in Saigon and did work for the US Department of Defense, um, doing an anal collecting and analyzing public opinion data among the peasants of, of South Vietnam. That work was extraordinarily controversial, uh, as you can imagine, and led in many ways to the company's uh, decline and eventual bankruptcy in 1970. Um, I'm really interested in the degree to which though, everything the company did has um, since been done well. The company did most of these things badly, but since then they've been done very effectively. And to me, when I came across the story, it, it was a little bit like, uncovering an unexploded landmine. Like here's this thing uh, that was buried a long time ago um, that you know is now exploding in our day, right? Like we see the implications of what it means to accept um, as a business proposition, the computer prediction of human behavior as a, you know, as a commodity that can be, that can be bought and sold. So um, that's just my brief sketch that maybe can get us started. So, cause I realize people have <laughs> I haven't read the book. I promise it's a more complicated story. But in brief, company is founded in 1959, went bankrupt in 1970, tried almost everything and mostly failed, but also set in motion a lot that we now take for granted and also many of us find very troubling. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, and I know it's hard to realize that a book was launched two days ago, so I'm sure many of you have not read it. But at the same time, this is a book launch and a book celebration. And so I'm going to put this up here for everybody to see because it is a brilliant and beautiful book. Um, and so one of the things for anybody who's ever been at a book launch with me, you will know that I will also engage in, an, um, in, in the sales pitch that has to happen at these things, which is that we should all celebrate Jill, not just from being here and not just from uh, borrowing the, uh, the book from the library, but also from buying the library, uh, buying the book from uh, wherever you feel fit. But I have put in the chat a place where you can go and buy the book. Um, but let's go dive in and have a fun time talking about some of the different pieces of the book. And so the place where I want to start is, a, you know, is a sort of question for you, Joe, which is that the book is the story of a corporation and its people and its tentacles. But it's also the story of American democracy's very complicated relationship with data and technology, which, as I've seen from a lot of your other books, it goes way back. But this moment of being able to dive deep really looks at a period of time where our politicians were very willing to embrace not just data, but the mirage of the technology. They didn't necessarily want to look under the hood and understand the details of it. They didn't want to understand the limitations. They very much were interested in the performance of data, what data could say, if it could speak, if you will. Um, and that's a really interesting place for data to uh, be, especially in such high stakes uh, contexts as you describe in your book. And so I'm curious, what is it about the American psyche that, and the you know, political structures that make that obsession with having data speak come so alive repeatedly over time, especially mm -hmm. in this period? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. I mean, American democracy depends on demography, right? It, it, the nature of our political system is mathematical. We count, we have to count the people, right? We're the first nation state to require an, a, you know, a decanal census. Like we could talk a lot about the census this evening, I'm sure. Um, you know, but that that's how the democracy works. Like it's a math problem, you know, even down to the this problem of slavery is solved, is it, you know, with a fraction. Um, it's not solved at all, obviously, but the um, what happens over the course of American history, the pattern that I see is anytime there's a new technology of communication, uh, which you could include the computer in, um, or the mainframe computer in, um, becomes, uh, it's a first sort of a storage device, but it, in a calculating machine, but it becomes a communications device. Um, the, there's political dis disequilibrium, you know, like suddenly communication is faster, more people can communicate, information is freer, look at the emergence of the penny press in the 1830s, say. And the people kind of rise up because they have this new power. And then they kind of get kind of tamped back down or, you know, but meanwhile, the favorite franchise has expanded. But, but generally there is, it's not like the technologies of communication are, are inscrutable or difficult to understand. Like 
we understand you anybody can understand how a telegraph machine operates right it's it's a it, even a telephone it's like well it is a little spooky it's kind of invisible but you can you know it's not it's not it's not hard um the radio seems kind of just like a telephone call <laughs> like it, people it's not it, they're not they're not self mystifying technologies the thing that's really interesting is by the time you get to you know the univac in 1951 that's used that's built to count the census in 1950 um, the culture has really uh, wrapped itself around uh, men of science. It is, is kind of part of the, the Cold War mandate. It's necessary to worship at the altar of engineers from MIT. So much so that it is a joke when you make fun of them. Like if people have seen Desk Set from 1957 when Spencer Tracy plays an MIT systems engineer and Catherine Hepburn pokes fun at him, it's like, oh my God, she gets to like say that to him even though he's a man of science. I mean, it's the age of the space race. Um, and and, and the, you know, the federal government is investing an enormous amount of money in the pursuit of science for the aims of national security. So, um, I, I think there's a contortion that happens there with those technologies that's quite different from other technologies that, that do have democratizing effects, um, but they're not inscrutable and they're not, uh, they don't present themselves as revelation. There's something that happens in the 1950s and it also has to do with the sexual politics of the era um, that these guys take themselves unbelievably seriously. Like you think about the guys in 1956, they go to the Dartmouth Summer Seminar and found the field of artificial intelligence. And it's like, guys, like, I mean, I'm sorry. Like, it's exciting. I, I recognize like, it's exciting work, but you think you're gonna create an artificial, like, and, and, and one of the things that so fascinates me about Simulmatics is these guys are trying to build a machine to predict human behavior but they're generally using it to predict the behavior uh, of two groups. One is black voters because they're, they're, the, their first study is a study of black voters. So there's something about the mysteriousness of the black mind, like these white liberals cannot imagine uh, without a machine. Um, and the other is the female housewife who's a consumer, right? They're trying to predict you come with a model of her mind. And when they go to Vietnam, where they're trying to come up with like a mathematical model ultimately of the Vietnamese peasant mind. Um, and, you know, to me as a humanist, I really like you're going to build a machine to do these things. Like, what, like, like 1960, they're constructing a mathematical model and writing a computer program in Fortran to understand black voters. Well, I mean, you could watch the Greensboro lunch counter sit-ins on television, or you could do that. Like, I, I, I find that, it, that, that the hubris um, is born of mid-century white liberalism in part, and that kind of technocratic moment that is um, put in place by the national security state's mandate for uh, scientific research at universities. Right. No, I think that's super important. I think, you know, early on in the book, you quote from Eugene Burdick, um, and that in the quote makes me think of what you're saying right now, because what he said, and I'm going to I'm going to read is the new underworld is made up of innocent and well intentioned people who work with slide rules and calculating machines and computers. Most of these people are highly educated. Many of them are PhDs and none that I have met have malignant political designs in the American public. They may, however, radically reconstruct the American political system, build new politics, and even modify revered and venerable American institutions, facts of which they are blissfully ignorant. And I think about that because it's in many ways, as you're pointing out, it's the story of technocrats. And in this particular context, the story of how white supremacy, uh, the culture of white supremacy gets upheld through these bureaucratic systems. Um, and you know, many of the people that are here care a lot about how to do good with technology. So how should they, you know, the, the people who are listening in tonight, how should they take from this context of what was happening there and technology that was quote unquote designed for good, but in fact upheld so many systems of oppression? How should they learn from that in the present? Well, I think, you know, for me, that Burdick passage was written in 1964, Eugene Burdick, a University of California Berkeley political theorist who had worked for Greenfield uh, in 1956 and who was asked to work for Simulmatics, instead wrote a novel um, indicting it. That's the kind of thing I study history for. Like I read that passage, you know, in the library and I think, 
wow, like somebody figured this out in 1964. Like he, he did predict, you know, that American politics as we know it would be destroyed by the, you know, the, the prediction of human behavior and that other venerable institutions, for instance, the local newspaper might uh, be destroyed as well. Like he, that you could foresee that is important to remember. The reason Burdick could foresee that, I would suggest, is because he was a political theorist and a writer. He was a novelist, he was a humanist, he was a theorist, and he had studied the math behind this prediction. And he, he, you know, he thought it was really compelling research. But his study of the American political order led him to think it would be inconsistent with doing this. And there, and that's where I think uh, these unnamed people who might be here this evening maybe could listen to that shockingly to me. When I hear about the uh, development um, and then distribution of a technological product like an app, say, I, I never hear in the course of that development a consultation with a political philosopher or a historian <laughs> or a poet about, well, what do you think this might mean and do? Um, because actually people whose lives are devoted to building that thing because it's cool to build can generally not answer those questions. But we have so wholly locked ourselves in the machine wherein we think the building is the important thing and the other kinds of knowing are just like, you know, it's like, you know, you know being able to know how to tie a bow tie or something, these like little luxury tricks that you might have if you know how to read a poem. Um, rather than that these things are the elemental things to the human condition. Uh, it's the dismissal of all that other kind of knowledge that's a, that's a problem. And Burdick was kind of quietly trying to say that, like, he, he And one of the things I love about the story is like these guys, these scientists, they aren't bad guys. They're actually trying to get the Democratic Party to take a stronger position on civil rights. Like they're very, uh, very assertive in that claim. And um, they're, they're trying to fix something. They're idealists. And uh, but they just they don't think about what the implications would be of what they're doing. And Burdick does and refuses to participate in it. And I, I we don't have enough of that. Uh, in the culture of Silicon Valley, say, or at least, I, well, what do I know? I, you know, I've driven through it, <laughs> but, uh, but that's my perception. Yeah, and I think that's where, you know, this is also such a fascinating time period because, you know, there's a rearrangement of um, political parties during this period. And, uh, you know, on page 57, you note that um, conservatives damned the godlessness and moral idiocy of behavioral science, citing its technocratic posture as a species of socialism, the control of the people, even their very minds by the states. Um, and or by the state. And I'm fascinated by um, the different political attitudes towards scientific and social scientific methods during this period um, and how this is getting structured. And um, Erica Robles Anderson actually wrote to me before this talk with a question of, of wanting to know how, you know, given this, given the attitudes towards social science, how do we understand that in light of the realignments happening in the 1960s as Southern Democrats and black voters switch parties? Um, and so how do these pieces all come together in that realignment? Yeah, that's a, that's a quite interesting question. I mean, politics was fundamentally changed by the modern public opinion polling industry, which really emerges in the 1930s, which is itself a major realignment, right? So when FDR, uh, runs for office in 1932 and is elected in 1933. Uh, he wins on the back of what is called the New Deal Coalition. And fundamentally what that means is he's able to pull in, for instance, black voters who can vote in the North. Blacks can't vote, vote in the Jim Crow South, vigilantism and, and terrorism. But black voters in the North, black, voter, black voters had voted Republican where they could vote. Republicans were the party of emancipation, the party of Lincoln. Uh, Roosevelt pulls together a whole new coalition that includes black voters and is a, a dramatic realignment. Um, it's, it's, it's unusual in other ways as well. Um, but modern polling, polling, which starts in 1935 with George Gallup, uh, tends to do weird things, weird distorting things to the electorate. So Gallup, for instance, refused to ask people questions about civil rights. There were sit-ins throughout the 1930s. There were anti-lynching bills in Congress every year. Uh, Gallup didn't ask people questions about civil rights. He's a nationally syndicated newspaper columnist in Southern newspapers, didn't want to run columns about civil rights. And he didn't poll black voters 
because um, most places in the country where there were the largest numbers of blacks, blacks couldn't vote. And he also didn't want to piss off his Southern subscribers. Um, so all that polling industry is doing is, is, is uh, segmenting the electorate in meaningful ways that reflect census divisions, but the census divisions, as we know, are all curse blockity, right? Like who is Mexican and are Mexicans white? Like is this weird freakish debate in the 1930s, an era of forced deportation of Mexicans and Mexicans, Amer Mexican Americans. So there's this, this the, the modern sort of bureaucracy of the New Deal uh, and the expanded administrative state of that era does collect a lot of data. Social Security Administration beginning in 1935. We have a lot more information that sorts people into demographic piles because of the New Deal. By the 1950s, that's not working well for the Democrats because Eisenhower has taken a stronger position on civil rights. Those black voters leave the New Deal coalition and, and vote for Eisenhower in huge numbers. And Democrats you know, are, are having a big fight with themselves between Dixiecrats and non-Dixiecrats. And um, so the, it's not to say that the, all of which is a long way to say, like we think of that realignment as a 1960s thing with kind of Nixon and the Southern strategy, but it really is that sorting begins to take place in the 1930s because of the new technologies uh, of counting people. And there are a lot of counting machines before we get to, you know, a UNIVAC. So what, what I think among the things that happens uh, with Simomatics and its kind of work in the 19, late 1950s and 1960s is the increasing sophistication at pitting demographic groups against one another. The Simomatics code divided American, sorted American voters into 480 possible voter types and then used that, that th those were the different categories it used for its simulations. And Burdick, when he wrote his n novel warning about this work called the book, The 480, because what he was kind of, among the things he was complaining about is if you divide, as a political theorist, if you divide the population into voter types and custom make political messages by type, like this is a message for you, you live in Brooklyn, you're upper class, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're an Asian American and you voted for uh, Obama twice, like that's a voter type. Um, then you are actually dividing Americans against themselves and you are defeating the philosophy behind our form of representative government because I am not supposed to go to the polls and vote as you know, a middle-aged Catholic New England woman who voted for Obama twice. I'm, and, and what is in my own interest? I'm supposed to go to the polls and think about who on the ballot can best represent, can, can best represent everyone's interests? Who, who's, whose policy positions are in the public interest and, and for the common good? And I can't do that if I've never received a message that says, here's my vision for everyone. If all the messages coming to me are coming to me as a voter type, not as 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 a, as a person who lives in a republic with a you know lowercase r, and that's what he meant by saying you know these people don't actually understand our political system, because if you understood our political system, you wouldn't do this because it will destroy it. All right. No, I think that's such a powerful you know, comment because I think part of what become so painful in the story is that you, you know, you referenced earlier on the way in which the Simimatrix Corporation worked hard to um, model uh, black voters. Um, and then later in the book, you of course go in to talk about their role in Vietnam um, and the campaign, the, the propaganda that was used as a campaign against the Viet Cong. You know, Charlton McCoon, who's um, a provost over at NYU and the author of Black Software, he wrote to me ahead of time, um, uh, sort of fascinated by these different um, components. Um, uh, and he was wondering how transparent internally or externally was Simulmatrix um, about its active role in shaping and even fomenting the anti-Black racial politics of the 60s. Um, so how would you, you know, characterize Simulmatrix long-term impact on civil rights beyond the particular period in which we're talking about? So uh, I think any of the people who worked for the corporation in the 1960s would be shocked to imagine that anyone could think of it as a company that was opposed to civil rights. Um, uh, these were some of the most progressive liberals uh, in the country working in the social sciences. Most of the scientists who had helped to found the company refused to go to Vietnam because they disagreed uh, with the one scientist who really supported that effort. Um, they, they tended to be people who were opposed to the war, uh, who marched against the war, 
uh, who urged their universities um, to withdraw support for research related to the war. Um, so, and, and in the meantime, I mean, Greenfield himself really, you know, had been um, a, a very passionate civil rights advocate as had been his, his wife, Patty, who was a big, you know, big part of their lives. You know, they lived in Chelsea. They, you know, she she was deeply involved in in civil rights activism. So were a number of the other women uh, who were married to Simulmatic scientists. Um, they also um, the company also had an educational division that was run by James Coleman, who goes on to write the Coleman Report, which is kind of like the Moynihan Report that is about um, school segregation. Um, and we might look back on that and and. And I think many people do uh, and disagree with the approach that someone like Coleman took in thinking about uh, educational opportunity. But these people were trying to, to, to fix inequality. Um, that's what they saw themselves as doing. Uh, and for the purpose of you know, doing work, studying, attempting to predict race riots, they were trying to forestall violence. And they were also trying to amplify the voices of people who were protesting on the streets because they were protesting police brutality. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think it's a complicated story. Uh, I, I think, you know, what emerges from that is, is, is something super creepy, but it's not, it's again, it's largely unintended. So did these, did, would the, any of these people have thought of themselves as um, advancing an, you know, an anti-civil rights cause or advancing some kind of a federal race, they wouldn't have understood themselves that way at all. That's super fascinating. You, know, you alluded earlier to the fact that, uh, to the census, right? Which um, as you know, I spent the last couple of years living and breathing um, all aspects of the census. And one of the things we're struggling with right now as we think about the census is what it means that the sausage is made so public during the current conversations, which is to say there's a lot of making of data um, around the census that long predates the 2020 census. But between um, the dynamics of the pandemic, between the um, issues of, uh, you know, uh, partisan interventions, etc., all of a sudden we're starting to talk about every detail about it. And one of the things I think about as you're, you know, going through the history of semiometrics is, you know, is it possible to even talk about the sausage of large data projects without delegitimizing the institutions that produce them? And obviously there are times where they should be delegitimized, but what are the you know, consequences there? And I think about this in light of, um, uh, you make a reference to Barrington Moore's notion of being blinded by the illusion of technical omnipotence. Um, uh, and I think that it doesn't just apply to computers, that sometimes technical omnipotence is also what allows us to just make certain that that data is infrastructure. And so how do we balance these moments of being able to see um, and understanding the place of uh, data and technology within a broader set of contexts? Yeah, I mean, I just think no one gets a right to be a priest just because you know a lot about something. You know, you don't get to say, oh, you little people, you can't possibly understand what we're doing. You just have to worship it. I, I just don't. I. I I'm a Catholic, but I'm too much of a Protestant with a lowercase p to believe that. I, I was recently reading two different things that kind of speak to this question now that I think about. One is an essay along, maybe from the 60s, that a colleague sent me called The Political Consequences of Science. And the other is an essay uh, by Daniel Allen, my colleague at Harvard, who's a political philosopher called The Road from Serfdom. And they, they both make kind of the same point, which is that our constitutional system in the United States was devised by lawyers. So the technocrats, you know, in 1787 were lawyers who had trained themselves in the study of history. And I would argue they were also historians, right? So when they said about drafting the constitution, instead of coming up with some secret document um, that they hid away and said, here are the rules from on high, they published it. You know, they, they sent it to the people for ratification and they encouraged people to convene and have conversations. And then they had formal uh, conventions where people debated it and then went through a ratification process. And I'm sorry, but if you've read the constitution lately, it is extremely complicated. Now, it's only 4,000 words, but it, it embraces a lot of ideas. These guys really did have faith. Now, I, their notion of who the people were is a very small, from our vantage, very small, from their vantage, unbelievably democratic. Um, and they believed that the people could decide whether this was a way like that. And so for, for much of American history, <laughs> The set of rules, the, the, the machinery, you know, and they called the Constitution a machine, and they thought that it was an engineered device. Um, 
was legible and transparent to everybody, right? And that's why it can be amended because people can decide this isn't even working anymore. Like I understand this so well that I can decide women should have the right to vote, God damn it, you know, or whatever. Um, but at some point in the 20th century, the people who were became the kind of engineers of society uh, became economists. And economists don't generally think that the people should understand economics. I mean, they do. I'm sorry. Many people teach economics. They would like people to understand economics. But the, but the, the, the posture of the economist is, is not, let me explain to you the supply and demand theory. Like the posture of the economist is, here's my prediction about the, you know, the stock market, right? Like it's just a different world. Um, but the, the economist was then replaced really with the scientist. And, you know, and, and what do you do when, you know, you get to something like, um, well, we could go into examples, but, you know, the, 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 the pro there's a problem when uh, people doing very complicated scientific work are making decisions about how the government should work, let's say, uh, with preventing a pandemic, uh, which is something that came up, has come up many times in American history. I would suggest that now we're in a completely different era where the people who are like making those big decisions, we certainly didn't choose them to be, the, the, but, but, but the, the people like at Facebook and Google. Um, and they, they really are the grandchildren of simulmatics in the sense that they love the self-mystification. You know, if people can't understand how to code, all the better, because I just want them to buy my app. Like we're making so much money for our stockholders right now. Uh, it's incredible. You can't even believe it. And so when these guys go like the summer of the hearings before Congress, you know, and Bezos sits there, like they like that the members of Congress don't understand what they're doing. Like that's that, that's the whole weird contortion. Um, this was a long-winded answer to your question, but um, if we if we have uh, systems, technologically um, sophisticated systems that are driving our politics that the people can't understand, then we no longer have a democracy. I think that's totally fair. You know, legal scholar Kate Klonick uh, refers to a lot of the um, CEOs of the tech companies as the new governors, um, as a way of capturing some of their struggle. Um, but at the same time, I think one of the things that's sort of fascinating is that they themselves don't know what to make of their own role in all of this. And one of the questions that we got in advance of um, the talk tonight was from Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. And he wants to know, you know, how should he be thinking about uh, the role of, of industry to build systems to support democracy rather than break it? Um, and what are the points of light from your own work for those who are in these positions um, as the executives of major tech companies uh, overseeing a lot of their future? And so what would you tell him about how he should be thinking about his responsibilities? Yeah, I mean, I think I appreciate the question and I, I by no means dispute its earnestness, but I think it rests on the supposition that CEOs of tech companies should be fixing our democracy. They shouldn't be. Um, the people need to fix the democracy and the people that the people elect to office need to fix the democracy. Um, I, I, I think, you know, the CEOs of tech companies should try to do less harm to our democracy, uh, but I didn't elect them to fix it. And I also think that question, um, at least, you know, indirectly rests on the assumption that more code will fix it. Um, that we just need to have better code. We just need to do some debugging. Like there is a kind of troubleshooting debugging mentality behind the way the question is framed. And I think that misses the much deeper critique that many people are making, which is we don't want the program at all. We don't want a program that works better. We don't want the program. And the, the anecdote that came to mind when you asked this question um, is, I remember going out to give a talk at Stanford a few years ago well, you know, it was like 2011 or something like that, a while back. And someone at dinner was telling me how her neighbor works at a startup and her neighbor, you know, she has lived in this house for like 50 years and like a, you know, a townhouse and her neighbor bought like three townhouses because like had all this money and like leveled the insides and made like a giant, like triple sized mansion or whatever and was out walking the dog. And they were talking about, um, she was trying to draw him out on the, the real estate problem in San Francisco and the problem of homelessness. And he said, you know, young guy, uh, you know, with his sneakers and his hoodie kind of thing. Um, this was a moment in time. I'm hoping this moment is over. He said, it's okay because my company has a really great program. Uh, we're teaching the homeless to code. And she told the story to everyone at the dinner table. It's like, 
that's like, that's the problem. Like no one disputes the earnestness of this young man and his desire, you know, to not be part of the problem, but his home is, is among the problems and teaching the homeless to code is not a solution to homelessness. Like, like it reflects no actual curiosity about the conditions of eviction, the conditions of economic inequality that contribute to home. Like it's all the things that we would study in other realms of inquiry, aside from writing code, you would need to study those things in order to think about what would be a good set of things to do. Um, that you kind of helicopter in and say, if only they knew how to code, um, like that. I probably don't need to gloss that story. I'm hoping that everybody listening to that story was like, that must be apocryphal, that never happened. And maybe it is apocryphal. Maybe that's just a story that makes the rounds among humanities professors at Stanford, but it spoke volumes to me. So that's fantastic. Um, there have been a bunch of different really valuable questions um, coming in the chat, and I'm going to start to turn to them. Um, but before I have to do the, inform, uh, the, the, the info break where we're like, check out the book, make sure you check out the book. Um, this is the opportunity where you can go and buy the book. Um, so I'm going to turn to one of uh, the questions from um, Eileen Clancy, um, and uh, Eileen wants to know, you know, how does a lot of the early advertising um, demographic segmenting, um, how much of that was uh, built, built on frameworks created within the census data, um, and if so, what are the decades, like how do those things intersect over time? Yeah, you know, I don't know all that much about the history of the advertising industry's use of census data. I think they have a lot of other market data that the big agencies like a J. Walter Thompson uh, have been collecting for decades. Companies that have been around since the 19 teens are doing a pretty good job of holding on to market research that they do for each of their clients. It actually is a pretty big problem for Simulmatics, which is to say that like most consumer data is, is proprietary in the era that Simulmatics is working. So what they wanna provide, um, you know, advertising campaign advice to a company like Ralston Purina, they're kind of in a bind because they don't know anything about the market for dog food. And like J. Walter Thompson, you know, bigger ad, ad agency does. They have reams and reams and reams of research. They haven't computerized it, but they know they know the industry really well. And some can't, they, they, they can't compile that data on their own. It would be too expensive. So they try to buy it from, they try to buy it and team up with different organizations or with the advertising uh, research agencies and things like that, or they, they at one point are going to merge with an advertising company just to get its data. And all their internal memos are like, we just don't actually have the data to do this. It's also true, though, that um, a lot of industries don't actually collect. This is one other thing that I, I learned that I thought was kind of fascinating, because a bunch of the cinematic sales guys go out to California and they meet with um, like movie production companies like MGM. They also meet with record um, companies like Columbia Records. And they're trying to do basically, like it really is a little bit like, like Amazon Prime Video or Spotify or something. Like they're trying to figure out how, how to help these um, film and recording industry companies uh, do targeted advertising. And they, they, they write back, these guys in Hollywood write back, they're like, you can't even believe this. MGM has no idea who sees their movies. No, they have no idea. They don't even track ticket sales by state. Like they have no, like they just, they just send out guys with the reels and they go to the local vaudeville house and they say, do you want to show this movie? And they show the movie and they take the money and it's not proportionate. They know not, like we have no data about who watches movies. Like you'd think that you could take the census data and work it against the sales, you know, by, by district or you, they would have a map of movie houses and like there would be some appropriate, they're like, we we can't sell them a predictive analytics tool. They have no data. And like, it would take us years of study to create, you know, a data set of moviegoers in the US. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Like I, that stuff is those, a lot of industries are really playing catch up because they've just been eyeballing stuff for years. And they have, you know, it's a little bit like the precinct worker for your party who knows everybody at the bar. And so has a pretty good idea how the vote's gonna go. Like they have these, you know, on the road sales guys who know how to sell, you know, the latest Errol Flynn movie and which movie houses to sell it to and how much to charge because they just kind of know. So it's, you know, 
fun to think about all of these layers, especially because I can't help but think about your earlier work on um, the secret history of Wonder Woman um, and the beginning of a lot of that um, uh, attempts to try to figure out those pieces. And so I'm going to take a question from Chris Peterson, who um, says, you mentioned uh, in some of your opening comments the relationship between simometrics and the sexual politics of the age. Um, and Chris notes uh, that a few chapters in, um, you attend closely to the sexual aspects of the character characters, including news articles about the tight sweatered women in Burdick's class, Greenfield's sexy cigars, the turn to Freud and the effects on their marriages. What made you decide to pull these dynamics to the fore of your narrative? Um, uh, um, it's fun to have someone who's actually read the book. That's very cool. Thanks for the question, Chris. Um, I, I think I didn't pull them to the fore enough, honestly. Like I, I, I really wanted to be able to do a lot more with the wives, um, and I, I, I didn't have quite enough, like with the exception of Minot McPhee, who was married uh, to the mathematical sociologist, Bill McPhee, I just didn't have that much. Minot wrote to her mother, as far as I can tell, every day, if not more than once a day, and the family was incredibly generous to share her letters with me. Um, so I had this very rich one female character who could reflect on everyone around her. She's the one who writes, you know, writes to her sister-in-law. These men, treat, they're women like, they treat their wives like dirt. Um, she's really interested in the sexual politics of the day and chronicling them. So um, I, uh, but I didn't have enough about, I didn't have enough about the other women to do uh, as fully balanced an account as I would have liked to have done. So I'm glad if it seems like I brought these women to the <laughs> <laughs> women to the fore. Uh, it's a regret of mine that I that I didn't have have more, especially about Ed Greenfield's wife Patty, um, who was a very tragic figure, and uh, I, I I really admired in many ways um, and was very compelled by. Thank you. So Alec Resnick um, points out that uh, given the corporate scientism was already a part of social critique when Simulatrix was founded, like White's organizational man, um, Alec's curious, could you comment on how the gap between the epistemology of data and the rhetorical qualities of data, as in objectivity, opacity, et cetera, played out within the corporation of Simulatrix? Like what were the axes of disagreement, political, epistemological, otherwise, um, within the corporation? and how were they negotiated? Yeah, so it's a really small, I mean, it sounds like I've made such huge hay with it that, you know, with some giant mega corporation, it's a handful of people at any given time. And they have offices in New York and Cambridge and Washington and Saigon, like at the at the biggest, uh, but there's, there's small offices. Uh, it's not a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of uh, dissent and dispute about what would be the best realm to seek clients in, you know, um, some of the people just really want to do political campaigns. Uh, some of the people really want to do uh, market, you know, we would think of as market research. And then there's, you know, there's the guy who really wants to do defense work. Um, so there's that. With regard to the, uh, uh, you know, evidentiary status of what they're generating, the real skeptic is a, is, is a quite sophisticated um, guy from Yale, Bob Abelson, who's one of the founders of the company and walks away pretty early on. He doesn't give up his stock, like he doesn't protest. Um, but when the Simulmatics Corporation takes credit for uh, Kennedy's election, Abelson, and then there's like all this national, you know, fury over it. Abelson wrote some memo that says like, here's a press release that I want issued if this doesn't die down right away. We did not win the election for Kennedy. We just don't have evidence of that. Like we gave Kennedy can Kennedy's campaign some advice. They did those things and they won, but that's not causal. Like he's a he's a social scientist who objects to the PR machine that that Greenfield is is running. So th there's a little bit of that, um, and there is. Uh, I don't think that any of these guys really question the value of doing, um, you know, quantified behavioral science. Like that's what they that's what they came of age doing and really care about. The, the one person who makes a kind of really interesting epistemological argument in print is Ithiel de Sola Poole, who's an MIT political scientist who was the chairman of the research board of Simulmatics. He writes an essay in the middle of the 1960s in which he claims that the behavioral, quantitative behavioral sciences are the new humanities of the 21st century, of the 20th century. That is to say in previous eras, statesmen, uh, you know, when preparing themselves to lead their people or wage a war, it was required of them that they study 
history and religion and language and philosophy, uh, you know, to wage the Peloponnesian War, whatever. You know, that they'd, be, that, 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 that they'd be sophisticated about art and music and theater, that this was what would make you a full human being uh, and therefore a good leader, and that that era had passed. And that now what a statesman needed was the predictions offered up by economists and political scientists and other quantitative behavioral scientists uh, who could tell you exactly what to expect and therefore give you the best advice to act. And uh, that's a really interesting epistemological claim. We, you know, that, that, like just a sort of very explicit denigration of the humanities and the elevation of not, interestingly, not of, you know, the real revolutionary sciences of the 20th century, the biomedical and biological sciences, the environmental sciences, uh, the physical sciences, like there are a lot of really measurable, incredible, uh, you know, astronomical, astronomical work done in the 20th century. Um, somehow I think of these signs, you know, the sciences these guys are working as the fuzziest of things, um, but that those were like at the top of the hierarchy of knowledge uh, was a claim that he, in, from a defense of having been attacked, he decides to make in print. Interesting. So, you know, as we think about all of these different methodolog methodological um, components of all of this, Jed Miller is asking if technologies like polls or hashtag data keep getting embraced narrowly, clumsily with uh, too little consideration, are there any examples from this period where data is taken with a you know, much more considered approach, with less hype, with more context, more awareness of power um, as part of decision making? Or is it all gone to this sort of hyped craziness? Uh, no, I think there's absolutely very measured and important research in many realms, and, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, where people are doing, you know, very careful, methodical work that's make you know, making possible and incredible revolutionary discoveries and, you know, in laboratories all over the world. So um, I, I think that the mystique of mainframe computers, partly because so much of what's being done in this era is trying to convince businesses to buy computers, because they're not, computers aren't being sold to people yet, right? They're being sold to corporations. So the corporate manufacturers of computers have to do a lot of razzle dazzle to get people to buy these enormous and expensive machines are going to be difficult to maintain. You're going to take up a lot of space. Going to require technical staff to use. Um, so the way they do that is, is you know, elevating them to some kind of altar. Uh, but that doesn't mean that people who use them, you know, are, are, are capable of doing incredibly, incredibly careful work. There is also a big hesitation, a, a big kind of pulling back from the kind of cult of data in the middle of the decade when the Johnson administration proposes the establishment of a national data center uh, as the third repository for the federal government, which has the Library of Congress, which collects, holds books and the National Archives, which holds manuscripts. Johnson administration, we need a data center that holds data, you know, computer data, um, to pulled together from the Social Security Administration, the Veterans Affairs, you know, uh, housing and unemployment, like all of it would be together in one place and we'd be able to use it, you know, uh, commensurate. Um, and there's enormous pushback against that and a backlash against it uh, because people say that if the federal government had all of our data in one place, that would violate our privacy. And there's this really interesting moment where there are congressional hearings and this guy from RAND, uh, Paul Baran, who's involved in developing packet switching, he's asked to come in and, and say whether, whether he thinks it's a good idea to proceed with the National Data Center. And he, he does, he's, he's very respectful, but it's almost like he's laughing at the members of Congress because he says, so you guys think you need to build a building to hold data? Because in a, like we'll, we're building the ARPANET right now. <laughs> like in a few a few years, all the computers are going to be connected and talking to each other. It'll be almost like their data is in a cloud. So your question is not like should we build this building. Your question is what protections should we enact through legislation for the ownership and exchange of data. Like this is your opportunity to do that. Like we you're having a big debate about building a national data center. It happens to be the wrong debate. You guys don't understand what we're doing. Let me try to explain it to you. Like he's not about the self mystification. He wants Congress to understand. And Congress is kind of like that's too complicated. We just won't build a national data center, you know. But it, it's from a historian's vantage that, that seemed kind of inevitable because they didn't really understand. Um, but you look back at that and you're like, oh, if only they'd come up with some rules about data in 1966. Like then those would have, you know, there'd be a precedent and maybe those would have been applied to corporate corporations and maybe we wouldn't be where we are now. 
It's so, then. They had done it. If yeah. then. <laughs> it's such a perfect title. So um, Tazatar uh, Handel, whose name I don't know beyond that, um, asks if tech companies should not be getting involved with democracy, um, they could at least start uh, a culture not to touch democracy, some rules, um, if, you know, by if breaking bubbles. And so, you know, given where you just left off, I'm curious, you know, how do you think um, about, you know, what kinds of governance of the data collection processes, you know, things like the blow up around the National Data Center, you know, we're in the middle of a whole conversation of modernizing data infrastructure again. Um, and most of it at this time and place is about trying to dismantle the role of the government um, in, in data production and try to think about it in other places. So given all of this, what role should um, you know, different kinds of data processes be put in place? How should we be thinking about the role of the, the different tech actors, but also the role of policy around data and tech, um, you know, to deal with all of this, given that it wasn't dealt with after 65? Yeah, that's what you do. <laughs> what I do. So I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, I would say that like, in my mind, the tech companies are kind of like fossil fuel companies. Like I wouldn't ask them to run the EPA. Um, we need the EPA. Uh, I don't trust the fossil fuel companies and um, I don't trust the tech companies for the same reason. I also, you know, don't buy that. I just don't understand uh, what they do um, and what, what effect it's having on all of us. Um, I just, I, I think that the metaphor works pretty well for me. So I, I do think, you know, that what's, what's required are, are legislat legislators who uh, get themselves better educated on these issues uh, and get better advice uh, and, 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 and try to remember the way the democracy was meant to work. You know, Jill, one of the things that I fell in love with your writing is the way that you, there's something beautiful about your craft. I, I often think of it as like a chocolate truffle because the writing just melts in your mouth and you show these different perspectives. Um, and there's That's because I eat chocolate truffles okay, the good. whole time that I'm writing. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's something about that way of speaking to the past and the present simultaneously in your writing. And, you know, some people are asking about this, both about craft and also beyond chocolate truffles, um, but also um, how should we be thinking at this moment about it reintegrating different forms of history into our educational processes? How should we be engaging people with history so that they can learn through the complex narratives that you do such a phenomenal job of, of building for us? You know, I, I think that actually uh, history education is mostly great. I think um, I, th I think K through 12 teachers do an incredible job trying to get kids excited about history. I think there are many obstacles in their way. Uh, one is that they don't have enough funding for the kinds of things that would make history most fun, the kinds of field trips and adventures and going to, to an archive kind of things or, you know, having an archival document set of facsimiles in your in your schoolroom. Um, but I spent a lot of time visiting K through 12 classes and I think there are tremendous, tremendous work going on there. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, in the United States, um, American history doubles as civics instruction and because we no longer have civics instruction. I think if we had civics instruction, American history could have a little bit more ambit to be uh, a training in the humanistic method of historical inquiry, which is what I think of what I do. Um, but, you know, um, the president gave, I think, an address today uh, promising to establish a new commission on the teaching of American history because all the way in which it's taught needs to be thrown out um, because we need to teach patriotic history. Um, history is, 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 is not a catechism. It's a, it's, it's, it's a branch of the humanities. Um, and I think school teachers know that. And uh, I think we just need to give them more resources and a whole lot more respect. Luckily, one of that re one of those resources is all of your phenomenal writing. And for those who haven't listened to Jill's uh, podcast, The Last Archive, you know, even in this moment where we're um, uh, at home, uh, but we can actually follow her all the way into all of these different archives. It's uh, the field trip of uh, a, a virtual age, if you will, which I appreciate. 
Um, we are closing out uh, on time. I'm going to once again do the infomercial. This is the book. If then, I strongly encourage everyone to take a moment of reading it. Um, before we close out, um, Jill, is there anything else you want to leave the audience with? Where you know, sort of final words here. Uh, you know, thanks for coming and caring about books and libraries. Uh, those are our best holders and stewards of data. And uh, this is my chance to thank the library for hosting the event, um, as well as you for uh, an incredibly stimulating conversation and all the questioners as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joel, over to you. Yeah, I just want to echo that and thank you both. Thank you, Jill, for writing this book and congratulations again on being longlisted for the National Book Award. And Dana, thank you so much for these terrific questions and for your own questions and the preloaded questions you had and then uh, fielding as many of these wonderful audience members' questions. And to the audience, thanks again. Please follow uh, Data and Society, BPL Presents, and the library. And of course, get a copy of Jill Lepore's If Then. Hope to see you all back soon, and uh, thanks again, Jill and Dana.